Hi everyone, um, we are here today with Ila, she's a PhD in, in Universa, University of uh, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University. And Ila, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Shai. It's really great to be here. So just uh, to be upfront with you, uh, this talk is going to be in English since it's recorded and uploaded to YouTube. And then uh, during the talk, I love questions and I'd be happy to have a discussion with you. So just feel free to unmute yourself or just jump right in if you have any questions. Um, I'll present a paper called Attend and Excite, which is a paper that we're going to present in CGRAF uh, in August. So let's get started. <laughs> just a couple of words about me to those of you who don't know me. As Shai said, I'm a PhD candidate and lecturer at Tel Aviv University. Um, my supervisor's name is uh, Professor Leo Wolf. I'm sure you all know him. And also currently, I'm a research intern at Google Research, working on surprise generative models as almost anyone else in the field. <laughs> um, so let's give some motivation as to what Attend and Excite does. So all these images were generated by a text-to-image model called Stable Diffusion. And a stable diffusion is a model that just takes any input text and then generates really high quality and diverse images based on your input text. So you can see that the model is not only expressive, but it also creative. So you can see here, for example, a teddy bear who is an astronaut walking in space. Um, you can see Darth Vader who is riding a bike in the forest or a lizard doing experiments in a lab. So uh, these models are really, really impressive. And then perhaps surprisingly, when we try to generate simple conjunctions of two subjects, such as a photo of a cat and a dog, the model often fails. So even with this simple example, I would say at least 40% of the cases, the model fails to generate both a dog and a cat in the same scene. So this is really surprising given the examples that we saw in the previous slide, right? It seems like the model is really expressive and really creative. So the question that we're asking in this work is what happened in the process of creating uh, an image with two subjects? Is it an issue of expressiveness where the model can simply not generate two subjects in the same scene? Or is it an issue of neglect where the model simply chooses to neglect some of the parts of the prompt such that the generation will be easier? And this is a question that we're asking uh, in this work. And in order to understand the answer to this question, we first need to understand the model and how it works. So stable diffusion is a type of a DDPM or a latent diffusion model. And DDPMs, are really nice models that work in a really intuitive way. So how they generate images is with two processes. So given the data that we have, uh, for example, this input image of a cat, we have the forward diffusion process. And the forward diffusion process gradually noises the image until we receive a noise, a pure noise latent. Okay, so this, this is Gaussian noise at the end of the forward process. And the generative model, what it learns to do is it learns to denoise uh, the image from pure noise back to a, a plausible image from the data gradually, meaning uh, the denoising process is a gradual process where we take a pure noise latent and slightly denoise it at each time step such, such that we achieve uh, a clean image in the final step. Okay, so this is a diffusion model. This is the basis of this entire talk. And stable diffusion is a type of diffusion model, but it is a latent diffusion model. So what is a latent diffusion model? If you notice here, the latent space of this diffusion model is in the same shape of the original image, right? Because we take the image, we add a noise to it and another noise to it and so on. So this is really expensive in, in space because images are quite large, right? A resolution of 224 by 224 images is quite a small image. So uh, these models are not really efficient. So what latent diffusion models did was keep this diffusion process, but instead of operating on the original image space, they operate on a latent space. So we have an autoencoder, and the autoencoder will map our image X to a latent C, and a decoder will learn to map a latent C back to its corresponding image X such that the diffusion process that you see here will operate on the latent space, the latent C, instead of the original image to save time and space. Okay, so this is the process of training a diffusion model. We have our input image X, the encoder E decodes the image into a latent C. The forward diffusion process that we saw before that noise the image operates on the latent space. And then this is actually the generative model itself. So the generative model takes an input pure latent ZT and gradually denoises it based on the input text. And as you can see here, this is going to be the star of this entire talk, right? The input text is inserted into the model such that the text will hit the model on how to denoise the input latent. 
So at each time step, uh, the, uh, the model takes the input latent and slightly denoises it using information from the text. And the information from the text is fused into the model using the cross attention mechanism that you see here. So information from the text is inserted into the model using the cross attention mechanism, and then the model knows how to denoise or slightly denoise the latent into the next input latent. And in the end, you get a clean latent Z, and you can use the decoder to decode it back to an image. Any questions so far, by the way? What is the process? latent? Okay, so the latent is the latent representation by the encoder. So you have the image, and you can think about it as sort of a downscaled version of the image. Mm -hmm. So the original image is maybe 512 by 512, and then the latent is 64 by 64. Okay. It's just to have the process be more efficient, right? Because how do we get the, the latent? It, the encoder and the decoder learn to map an image to, and, and then this is an auto encoder that is trained separately from the diffusion mm -hmm. model. It's like an embedding of the image? Yeah, it's okay. like an embedding of the image, and then the diffusion process operates on the latent to save time. Oh, okay. okay? Yeah. But uh, the main thing to remember about this entire process is this part, right? We have our gradual denoising, where at each time step we, we take ZT and output a slightly less noisy uh, latent ZT minus one, and uh, this is conditioned on the text, right? So let's zoom in into the process of a single denoising step, right? So we said we have a noisy latent ZT, and we have our DDPM, our unit, that takes the noisy latent and the text and outputs a slightly less noisy latent ZT minus one based on the text. So what you see here is an example of a generation process by stable diffusion for the prompt aligned with the crown. And as you can see, the image features the lion, but not the crown, right? So somewhere in the process, the model either neglected to attend to the crown, or it simply could not generate, wasn't expressive enough to generate the line with the crown. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom into the process where the text is injected into the model and see why the crown was not generated to try to explain the deficiency of the model. So the cross attention mechanism basically takes a query and a key. And I won't go into explaining the cross attention mechanism because we've already explained the fusion models. But basically, cross attention just creates this matrix, this attention map, where for each patch in the image, right, we can split the, this image of the lion into patches, into a grid of patches. So for each patch in the image, we can take a look at all the text tokens, right, a lion with a crown, and uh, have an attention value for each one of the tokens in the sentence. And these attention values actually determine which token is generated in which patch of the image. So for example, the first row here is going to correspond to the first patch in the image, the left patch here. Mm -hmm. And the attention values are going to tell us which token is generated in the first patch of the image, right? Mm -hmm. So these attention values actually tell us what the model generates and where it generates the information in the input image. So if you notice, each one of these columns, attention columns, corresponds to a single token in the text, right? So we can take the column, which is P by P, the shape of the image, and reshape it to be a spatial map indicating the attention values for the token throughout the entire image. So you can see here the spatial maps for A, lion, with A, crown. These attention values or these spatial maps show us where, if at all, the model generated the uh, token in the image. So you can see that the lion has high attention values or high activation in the middle of the image where the line is generated in the image. While for crown, which is the second subject that we, we assume should be generated in the image, no high activations are generated at all in the entire image. So now we've pinpointed the problem. Crown, the token crown, does not get high attention values or high activations anywhere in the image. And this is the reason why a crown is not generated and a lion is generated. So we can definitely see visually the reason why uh, some of the, of the uh, subjects are generated and some of the subjects are not generated. So we can formulate a simple rule. Low attention equals no generation. When a subject has high attention values anywhere in the image, it is generated. And if it doesn't have high attention values anywhere in the image, it's not generated. So now we've actually pinpointed the origin of the issue, or we can identify the issue really simply, right? By just observing the attention maps, as we saw. So now that we know that the issue is neglect, right? Basically, we're neglecting to attend or neglecting to activate some, some subjects in the input prompt. Mm -hmm. How can we fix this? How can we prevent this from happening? 
So the idea is going to be generative semantic nursing. And we call this process semantic nursing because at each time step of the generation or at each denoising time step of the DDPM process, we're going to encourage the model to pay more attention to the subject that is neglected. So what we're going to do is we're going to slightly shift the latency T, the latent that is inserted into the diffusion model at each step. We're going to slightly shift it such that we encourage the latency T to attend to the neglected subject. And what you're seeing here uh, below is a result of applying the same generation process with the same seed using attend and excite, using our method. And as you can see here, the attention values for crown are high in some parts of the image are activated. And then the corresponding image generates a lion with a crown. So this is actually showing you how this generative semantic process at the end is fixing the generation. But let's take a look at what we're actually doing right in practice. So we're going to modify the latent ZT. And as I said, the cross tension mechanism takes queries and keys and the queries are just a projection of ZT. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to shift ZT using a gradient of some loss that we're going to define. And then shifting ZT is actually shifting the queries, shifting the values here on this matrix. So we're going to shift the ZT such that we encourage it to attend to uh, the neglected subject ground here. So now all we have left to do is define the shifting criteria. How do we know how to shift ZT in order to encourage the generation of the crown? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the attention maps for all the subjects in our sentence. In this example, lion and crown. And for each subject, we're going to take a look at the maximal attention patch. OK, so we know that lion is generated in the image. Therefore, there is some patch with the maximal attention value, right? We saw that already. And then for the crown, even the maximal attention patch is really low. So what we're going to do is we're going to formulate loss functions to capture this intuition directly, right? We have some intuition and then our loss functions directly capture our intuition. The loss is going to be the complementary of the maximal attention value, such that if a subject is generated, the complementary is going to be really low, right? Because this attention value is very close to one. And if the subject is not generated, this is going to be very close to zero. And then the loss for this subject is going to be really high. OK, so the loss actually captures our intuition directly. Any questions so far? Anyone? But you need to make an individual loss for each the token. Yeah, we'll go, we're going to see now how we formulate the overall loss for all the subjects. Okay. Any other questions from the crowd? OK, so I'm assuming everything is clear. <laughs> Let's move on. <clears throat> so as Shai asked, we have now a loss for each one of the subjects and we need to define an overall loss such that the shifting criteria will operate on the overall loss. So the overall loss is going to be the loss of the most neglected subject, meaning the maximal loss of all the tokens that we want to enforce in, in the input prompt. So in this case, uh, the loss L is a maximum of L2 and L5, right? Two and five because uh, lion is the second token in the sentence and crown is the fifth token in the sentence. And then the shifting, the actual generative semantic nursing is going to be a gradient descent step. We just shift ZT by the gradient of the loss that we just defined. OK, so really simple, right? Really intuitive. We define the criteria based on our intuition from the model, right? The information was extracted from the model itself. And then we define the shifting criteria based on our intuition directly. So did we solve the problem? Now we encourage, right, a high attention activation for each one of the uh, tokens in this sentence. Uh, we notice an issue of kind of a mode collapse where you can see here that there's a high attention value, right? You see the high attention activation for the crown, a rabbit with a crown in some patch of the image, but then our method does not enforce that there are few patches, right, in the image that are, have high attention activation. Basically, the model can choose whatever patch in the image to assign a high activation. So we can simply choose to assign a high activation in one patch. And then it's kind of a mode collapse where you kind of see a beginning of a crown on the rabbit's head, but it's not an actual crown. So the issue is that the loss that we formulated does not enforce uh, a full generation of a subject, but just a generation of a patch of a subject somewhere in the image. Um, so we didn't really solve the problem entirely. So we fix this with Gaussian smoothing. 
What we would want to do is instead of just looking at the patch, we would want the value of the patch to be impacted by its neighbors too, such that if we enforce the high attention value of, of the patch, it enforces a relatively high uh, attention value, or at least some attention value on its neighboring patches too. So what we're doing is we're using a Gaussian filter on the input tension maps. So you can see here that uh, these are the original attention maps, and these are the maps after the smoothing. And you can think about the smoothing as, as some kind of like um, blurring of the image, as you can see here. Um, what it does is it basically creates each patch as a, a linear combination of the patch and its neighbors. Mm -hmm. And the distribution is defined such as the value uh, of the patch is the highest in the distribution, and its neighbors are getting kind of a lower values, but they are still impacting the value of the patch itself. And then instead of defining the loss on the original attention maps that you see here, we're defining the loss on the maps after applying the Gaussian smoothing, such that now when we uh, demand that this patch is going to have a high activation in the image, it's going to be actually this patch and also its neighboring patches, because just this patch is not going to be enough. It's, if its neighbors have a zero attention value, then the average is going to be lower than one. Right? And again, uh, the loss is the maximal loss between all the subjects, and we can update uh, the latent by a, a, a simple gradient descent step. Any questions so far? Okay, great. Um, so now the problem is solved. So you can see the exact same uh, example, first without applying the Gaussian smoothing, and then after applying the Gaussian smoothing. So you can see that the problem is solved such that a simple one patch solution is not enough when we use Gaussian smoothing. So let's take a look at an overview of the entire process that we've just described. So we have our denoising process that takes a, a noisy latency T and slightly denoises it at each time step, right? And then at each generation time step, what we're going to do is we're going to extract the cross attention maps as we saw before. And we'll define our loss function directly on the attention maps after the Gaussian smoothing. We're going to update the latent ZT here uh, according to the gradient descent step, and then we're going to repeat the process with the shifted the shifted uh, latent ZT tag that you see here, right? So we're going to repeat the process such that the unit takes into account all the subjects and then continue on with the process. And this happens for each one of the generation steps. So this will happen for ZT and ZT minus one and ZT minus two and so on until the end of the generation. And we call it generative semantic nursing because each one of these steps slightly shifts ZT. Uh, and this is because we don't want to uh, cause an out of distribution latent ZT, right? So we don't want to shift ZT too much. So what we're doing is gradually as the denoising process occurs, we gradually uh, shift the latent ZT at each time step accordingly. OK, so and a question that usually arises and maybe didn't arise because it's kind of a new subject for some of you is what will we do if there is more than two subjects in the image, right? So in this example, we had lion and crown, but some examples can have multiple subjects like five, six, 10, 20 and so on, right? And our loss function, if you recall, uh, attended to the maximal or the maximum maximally neglected token. So what will happen if we just leave this as is, is it is possible that our process will only encourage the generation of the most neglected subject, but then what about the other subjects in the text, right? There could be multiple neglected subjects. So we improve this further with a process called uh, iterative refinement. And the idea of iterative refinement is we're going to compute the loss, compute the shifted latent, as we saw before, and then we're going to compute the loss again. And after we compute the loss again, we're going to ask, is the loss low enough? Meaning, are all subjects in the prompt attended to? If the answer is yes, meaning we shifted the latent enough such that all subjects are attended to, we can continue on to the next process in the generation. But then if the loss is not low enough, and imagine a, a process where some of the other subjects is now neglected, right? And then the loss will be high because of another subject. We will repeat the process and compute the loss again for the different subject. Okay. And this process actually iterates and repeats itself until all subjects are attended to, meaning until all subjects receive a high enough attention value, right? Mm -hmm. But then, as I said before, we do not want to shift ZT too much such that we're out of distribution. 
because this is a really dangerous uh, a thing to do, right? Iteratively shifting ZT without any restrictions. So if we're going to do, as we did the generative semantic nursing gradually, we're going to do the iterative refinement gradually as well. So we're only going to do iterative refinement in steps 0, 5, and 20 of the generation, meaning in the first steps, right? So diffusion models usually operate such that the location of the subjects is determined in the first generation steps, and then the fine details are determined in the last generation steps, which actually makes sense, right? So we're only going to operate on the first denoising steps, and we're going to do this gradually. So we're not going to demand that uh, mm -hmm. in step zero, the attention is going to be one for all subjects, right? Because this will shift us out of distribution definitely, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to gradually uh, increase the attention values as we increase the generation steps. So in step zero, we're going to uh, demand a minimal attention value of 0 0.05 for each one of the subjects. In step five, we're going to demand a minimal attention value of 0 0.2 for each one of the subjects. And in step 20, we're going to de demand a really high attention value. And by the way, the attention values are always between zero and one. So mm -hmm. point 0.8 is a really, really high attention value. So we're going to gradually encourage the model to generate all the subjects in the prompt. Any questions until this Why point? Is, uh, those numbers? Zero oh, five. As I, yeah, as I said, we're, we're going to gradually encourage the increase of the attention values. So we don't want to shift ZT too much such, a, such that it's out of distribution. So the attention values are between zero and one. And usually neglected subjects or subjects that are not generated in the image will have an attention value of zero. So in the first denoising step, we're going to demand a minimal attention value of 0 0.01 for each one of the subjects, such that a little information, if you if you may, is generated in the image. And then any denoising steps are there? 50, usually 50 okay. denoising steps, but it depends on the model. Some models have less uh, denoising. It's actually also dependent on the noise scheduler that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so 25 steps can be enough, but in this case, we're using 50. Okay, thank you. Did you see any correlation between the number of subjects and the number of steps that you need to interfere? Maybe if you have like 10 subjects, mm -hmm. then you need, I don't know, 10 steps or something like that. Ah, oh, that's an amazing question. We, we also have another limitation on the number of steps mm -hmm. for the iterative refinement because we don't want to be stuck in an infinite loop because sometimes, by the way, the model is just not expressive enough to generate some conjunctions. So some prompts are just not feasible by the model. And then this process can be infinite. Uh, but then it does depend on the number of subjects, but also on the nature of the subjects. So if you're the kind of, between. yeah, the correlation between them. So if you're writing a prompt that kind of seems natural, mm -hmm. like a dog and a cat, the iterative refinement is actually not really used because the attention values are high enough just by the, the process, the original process that we've described. But the more creative you get with your prompts or the more out of distribution your prompt is to the model, the more iterative refinement steps you need. So I would say it's not necessarily about the number of subjects that you have, but more about the type of subjects that you have, right? Any other questions? I wanted to ask uh, about uh, the last uh, example. Maybe it's out of the, of, out of scope. Um, the the with uh, lion with with a crown. Uh, mm -hmm. How you uh, how do you uh, uh, represent the the with? Oh, uh, okay. So uh, some some th that's a great question because I kind of assumed we are all on the same page as to what subjects we want to enforce, right? So we're only using nouns uh, for this method, and we're not enforcing other parts of speech uh, in this specific work. So we're not working on adjective, uh, proverbs, pronouns, and so on. So we're only working on the nouns, or on the actual subjects of, of the prompt. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other works that actually try to deal with compositions, and I'll touch on that at the end of the talk. So great question, but keep it in mind, and we'll talk about it uh, in a few slides. OK, thank you. OK, so now that we've understood the entire process, let's take a look at some results to see that this method actually works. So here's the example of a cat and a dog that we saw at the beginning of the talk. 
You can see here examples generated by stable diffusion, and stable diffusion often either fails to generate a, both a cat and a dog, or generates kind of weird matches of a cat and a dog. I'm not pretty sure why the model generates such weird images. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, in a lot of the cases, the model does not generate the cat and the dog in the same scene, as we said. And these are two baselines of other works that try to deal with issues of compositionality and stable diffusion. So you can see that composable diffusion often generates a single subject, and they're actually no two subjects in the image. And then structured diffusion often kind of mimics what stable diffusion does. And when it does generate both subjects, they are kind of unnatural. You can see the mouth of the cat here and the tongue of the dog here. And then when using our method attend and excite, I like to highlight two things here in these examples. First, you can see both a cat and a dog in the image. That's pretty obvious. But then also uh, our method does not hurt the expressiveness of the model. So you can see that there are different breeds of dogs here and different colors of dogs here, different breeds and different colors of cats and backgrounds and shapes and so on. So you can see that the method really preserves the input prompt, but also preserves the expressiveness of the model. Um, here's another example that is really cool. So we touched on one uh, issue that we call in the paper catastrophic neglect. And catastrophic neglect is when you actually ignore some parts of the prompt. But then there are other semantic issues to uh, generative models such as stable diffusion. The issue that you're seeing here is called wrong attribute findings. Mm -hmm. And in this prompt, you don't really have only subjects. You also have attributes that are related to each one of the subjects. So we would want to generate a red bench and a yellow clock. And as you can see here, stable diffusion either not generates both subjects, but even when it does generate both subjects in this example here, you can see that the clock is red instead of the bench being red, and the bench is yellow uh, is yellow instead of the clock being yellow. Okay. But if you use only nouns, um, where do you that's a wonderful question. Yeah, I'll touch on that in a bit. <laughs> um, but let me just uh, reiterate that the results of attendant excite both generate uh, all the subjects, right, and generate the correct colors that are attributed to each one of the subjects. And as you can see, the clocks here are really diverse. So you have different types of clocks. And here's another thing that I like to point out in my talks. It's really cool that the model actually knows how to generate the hours on the clock correctly, which is not really a common thing for generative models. So this is also a thing that I like to point out. These models are really expressive and they have a nice knowledge of the world. So as to the great question that I was asked here, we're only enforcing the attention on the subjects, on the blue tokens here, bench and clock. So how come the issue of correct attribute bindings is solved as well? So um, let me just go back, really back, <laughs> sorry for that, uh, to the architecture of the model to explain this point. And another question, which model is the base model that you're using? Stable it's stable diffusion. It, this specifically is stable diffusion 1.4. Um, you can go on diffusers and load different types of models, and we also support in the code the latest stable diffusion version, which is 2.1. Okay. okay, so as you can see, the text here is actually being uh, forwarded through the model tau here, tau theta. So tau theta is a text encoder. So the information about the text that is being inserted into the model has already undergone encoding. And this encoding is done using a bird-like model, right, a transformer encoder. And then what a transform, transformer encoder does is it, it creates contextualized representations for each one of the tokens, right? And then uh, when we're talking about the information that the model sees, that the generative models actually see, this is the information after the contextualization by the transformer. And therefore, this is my personal assumption, right? In the paper, we present this assumption, but we don't have empirical evidence to support that this is the reason why this is happening. So uh, clock, the, the representation for clock already uh, incorporates information about the properties from the text mm -hmm. that are related to it. So you can think about it as the text model incorporated the information about yellow into the representation of clock and the information on red into the representation of bench, such that we enforce attention on bench and on clock and kind of inadvertently or unintendedly also uh, enforce attention on these tokens because bench contains information on red and clock contains information on yellow. Any other questions? So why does uh, why does stable diffusion mix them up if it's already in the transformer? Yeah, that's a great question as well because it just ignores parts of the text, right? It it ignores whatever is easier to generate. 
So it either does not pay enough attention to each one of the subjects or it does not pay attention to the subject at all. <laughs> um, so, so it kind of mixes, chooses and fuses whatever parts are easier to generate in each one of the generation paths. So it's either neglect the subject itself, that's it, or it neglects the information about Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And then you could see that when it neglects the subject itself, the attention value is probably going to be close to zero. Mm -hmm. And when it neglects other parts of the subject, then the attention can be not zero, but then but yeah, the, the, not one, yeah. like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Right. And here's an example of a complex prompt, right? We talked about prompts with more than two subjects. So this is a playful kitten chasing a butterfly in a wildflower meadow. And as you can see, stable diffusion failed to generate uh, the butterfly near internal images, and then attend and excite fixes this issue. And then also another thing that I'd like to point out is that the images generated are kind of fitting nicely to the prompt because the kitten kind of seems to chase the butterfly around, especially in these examples here that are also part of the teaser for our paper. Here's another complex example, a grizzly bear catching a salmon in a crystal clear river surrounded by a forest. So no salmon in the original images generated by stable diffusion and then attend and excite generates images that are fitting the prompt. Again, the bear kind of seems to chase the salmon in the river. Uh, and, okay, okay. A quick, quick question. You, you're, you're, also, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. you're also working with, with verbs here, so it's not just nouns. What did we do? Okay. <laughs> Catching, you're also working working with verbs like catching and uh, with, with the kitten. Oh, no, 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 we're not working with, no, we didn't operate on the verbs at all, no. Um, and by the way, if you did want to operate on the verbs, I will say that the attention values for different parts of speech in the sentence should be different. So catching, even if it's generated in the image, will not get an attention value of one because it's not an actual subject that is generated in the image. And then we would need to change our entire algorithm such that we fix another attention threshold to make sure catching is generated. So in this example, actually, we're not enforcing anything else. We're just enforcing, enforcing that all subjects are generated in the image, and then the model kind of knows on its own to uh, attend to the other parts of the sentence because it's expressive and it understands text, basically. So this is just a side product of enforcing that all subjects are generated. And uh, someone else had a question? I think maybe Leo, possibly? Yeah. Sorry, I just couldn't see the salmon and the bear, and then it just had a delay, like a... <laughs> oh, delay. oh. Okay, sorry. Sorry for calling all good, you all good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so here's another example of a really cool process that was uh, correctly generated by attending the site. And then basically this entire idea for this project came from other research that I was working on. Um, so the attention maps can often be considered an explanation for the generation, right? If we want to explain how the model generated each part of speech in the sentence. We can take a look at the attention maps and then observe the high attention activation such that we know where each subject is generated in the image. And by the way, by using these explanation or these attention maps, there are several other amazing works that did really great things like image editing and so on with the attention maps. So these are really expressive and intuitive and a valuable tool for many downstream tasks, not just the tenant side. So as you can see, uh, before using attend and excite, uh, the attention maps were not really constructed as explanations because when we took a look at the cat and the frog, for example, the attention map for the frog did not really explain where a frog is generated in the image because the frog was not generated in the image. But then after applying attend and excite, you kind of get additional faithfulness or additional explainability value to the generation uh, because now a frog is also generated and you can take a look at the attention maps and the attention maps are actually really uh, really valuable as a signal to explain the model but then if you're interested in explaining generative models here's a spoiler alert to a new paper a new preprint that we just released this is a preprint from my work at google research um, we're actually taking an attempt at explaining generative models so i guess you at microsoft have worked with generative models right obviously chat gpt in some sort of form or shape and explaining generative models is really uh, difficult but also really important because as you know we're talking right now about the dangers of ai and how ai can affect our daily lives and so on and 
in this work, if you're interested in explaining generative models, we actually took a crack at trying to explain stable diffusion. So we're trying to understand why stable diffusion generates this image, for example, for sweet peppers and this image for snake and this image for oak and so on. So what our method can do is it can take a concept, a textual concept such as pepper, snake, snail, oak, and decompose it into the features that the model used to generate the images. So as you can see, the model makes semantic connections that are not human-like at all. So for example, here, sweet peppers are generated as a combination of fingers and pepper, such that the shape is borrowed from the fingers and the actual texture and semantic features are borrowed from the pepper. This one is one of my favorite examples. An oak tree is generated by a sequoia and a staff. So you can see that the structure of the tree is borrowed from the sequoia, right? The, the, uh, the tree itself is the sequoia. And then the semantic features such as the color and the branches are taken from the stag. So the stag's horns are the branches of the tree and the color of the stag's fur is the color of the tree itself. How did you do the composition? How do you understand the features of the <laughs> That's a great question. So this is an entirely different paper. I just wanted to present it because we're talking here about explanations. Okay. Um, but the main idea of this paper is just trying to track the denoising process and see for each denoising step what features are added during this denoising step. So we did an optimization where the model could choose any word it wanted from the dictionary yeah. in order to optimally denoise or make the, this specific denoising step. And then you can see other semantic connections such as a snake is uh, decomposed into a hose this whole shape, right, plus gecko. So again, shape plus texture. And the snail is a ladybug plus winding. The spiral on the snail is a shell. So really semantic connections that are not made by humans. And here's the part that I was most uh, shocked and maybe disturbed by. Um, these decompositions actually reveal biases. So there are obvious biases that we already know, like gender biases. So secretary is represented by wife, hostess, actress, women, girl, ladies, right? But then there are also other uh, biases that are not easily detectable by just looking at the images, but they just pop out when you let the model choose which word to use to, no to denoise the model. So as a Jewish person, for journalists, seeing the word Jews was really disturbing for me personally. And then we have drinking, which is represented by cheating, millennials, blonde, drunk, <laughs> uh, booze, and so on. So here's an example of how explaining models can show us some really disturbing biases that are not actually observable by just looking at the images. And I think it's really interesting uh, for us to discuss this matter because right now generative models are almost everywhere and we're using them right in our everyday lives and in our work. So it's really important, I think, to uh, kind of develop algorithms to explain why the model does what it does and how it generates its outputs to better understand what the model has learned about the world. Um, here's another interesting thing that we found in this work. Um, so when we're talking about uh, concepts with multiple meanings, for example, crane is both the machine, right, the crane, and also a bird. So you can see that in the decomposition, um, you have the word stork, which actually kind of gives away the information that the model mixes the two meanings of uh, the concept. And you can see here that when we uh, see the input image here, the, the crane is kind of shaped as the bird's head. And you can see that when you remove stork from this image, the uh, image looks kind of more like the machine. And when you enforce stork back, you can see how the machine actually becomes the bird. So the model actually learns to interpolate or mix the different meanings of uh, multiple meaning concepts. So you can see here an, another example of a date, right? A date can be both the fruit and date, dating, and so on. So you can see a date that is shaped as a heart. And when you remove the word dating from uh, the decomposition, you get the date, the fruit, which is actually shaped like a heart, if you notice. Mm -hmm. And when you increase dating, you get more of a heart and less of a of the, of the fruit. So what we're seeing here is that the model actually learns to interpolate different meanings of the same concept that, that it learns. So three observations that I just showed you of what we can do when we decompose concepts by stable diffusion, the same model that we saw with attendant excite. And if you're interested, this work is called the hidden language of diffusion models. It's like two or three weeks old. So really, really new. Okay, we're done. We're all done. And uh, thank you so much for listening. But let's take a look at some of the points that we discussed for attend and excite, right? So attend and excite is applied at inference time. We didn't fine tune the model. We didn't use additional data. 
we didn't do anything complex or uh, really sophisticated other than just understanding what the model does at each time step and then guiding the model based on simple intuitions. Um, so for those of you who know classified free guidance, if you don't know it, that's OK. But if you do know classified free guidance, um, the notion of generative semantic nursing is kind of similar to classified free guidance in that we encourage the model to pay more attention to the text and generate based on the input text. And the idea of generative semantic nursing is potentially generic. Here we use generative semantic nursing with the attention objective, right? With the objective of enforcing attention. But then we could also shift the length and TT based on other criteria that we can think about, right? To enforce other things. So for example, if we wanted a certain subject to be generated in certain parts of the image, we could uh, make sure that the attention values are one only for the bounding blocks where we wanted to generate the subject. So this is just a simple example that I can think about off the top of my head, but this is a generative. Uh, this is a general concept that can be generalized to other uh, objectives other than the objective we defined with the attention values. And this work was conducted before my Google days, <laughs> so it was conducted at the university. And Simple Fusion is a model that is huge and was trained on uh, Lion 5 billion. So basically a model that was trained on a lot of data and we didn't have the resources to pre-train the model or really fine tune it extensively. But this work actually shows that you can do pretty sophisticated things with very low resources. So we did it with a 16 giga GPU, which is really small <laughs> in comparison to uh, what these models were trained on and we were still able to improve the model significantly. I'm all done, so thank you so much for listening and thank you for joining in and I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them.